In this video, I'm going to show you a data analytics framework that I use personally as a data analytics lead and that you can use the same whenever you have to deal with any sort of data analysis. This is a framework that you can use in case you're a student and maybe you're working on side projects to show your data analytics skills, or maybe you are looking for a data analytics job. And so this is again, a framework that you can use in the business case that the company sends your way as part of the interview process. And of course, this is a framework that you can use at work whenever you have to perform some data analytics. And if you like what you see in this video, this is a little spoiler of what we're going to do in my new analytics and automation academy this is a six weeks program where i teach you everything you need to know about data analytics but also ai in order for you to land a job in data analytics and also master ai to make yourself more effective and productive you can find the link in video description and now enrollments are officially open but without further ado let's get straight into the data analytics framework okay so as i was saying before super important to have a framework that you follow in data analytics so that you kind of show yourself as someone that as a clear structure, as a clear thought process and logic in whatever you're doing. And so let me get straight into the first step of this data analytics framework. So the first step here is phase one, and we call it framing the problem. And just by understanding this first phase and following this uh, first step, you can already distinguish yourself as someone that, well, doesn't go straight into the data and try to understand insights and build dashboards and, sh and charts, but instead really takes a step back to actually understand the problem that we're trying to solve. And so the first thing that we have to do here is what is called stakeholder discovery and persona mapping. So in order for us to start any kind of analysis, we have to understand who is uh, our audience, who is on the other side. And so, and so a method that you can use is actually creating what is called persona cards. And so you can literally define your persona, your stakeholder, defining the roles, the goals, the pain points, and the data fluency. And we're going to see a real actual example in just a second. Once you define the persona and your stakeholder who is on the other side, then you can define clear answerable questions following the SMART criteria, which means specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And so again, this is a simple framework that you can use to really understand the questions that you're trying to answer as part of your uh, data analysis. And so specific Specific means, okay, what do I want to accomplish? Measurable means, how will I know when it's accomplished? Achievable, how can the goal be accomplished? Relevant, does this seem worthwhile? And time bound, when can I accomplish this goal? And so if your question follow most of these five elements, then you are pretty clear that you know where you're going and you know what you're doing. And then once you define your questions, then it's time to translate those questions into uh, KPIs. And so for example, revenue growth or churn rate. And this may seem a bit theoretical, and this is why I have a very clear example here. So the first step is to identify the persona, so creating a persona card. And so for example, you may have have this Sarah, which is a marketing manager. Her pain point is that uh, she doesn't know which channels bring in the best leads. And in terms of data fluency, she's an intermediate. So she uses dashboards, but avoids uh, SQL and raw data. And so the smart question that we can define here is, okay, which marketing channels generated the highest number of qualified leads in the past 30 days? And so these question here why it's a, it's a good question because it's specific so it's uh, focused on marketing channels and qualified leads is measurable because we literally count the qualified leads per channel is achievable because we can probably pull this from our crm or any analytics tools that we use in the business it's relevant because obviously it's a uh, uh, addressing the pain point of Sarah. And also it's time bound because we clearly define the 30 days uh, timeline. And so now that we have this very clear question, then we can translate it into a KPI and our KPI will be the qualified leads per channel for the last 30 days. And so we have our dimension, the marketing channel, then we have our metric and so the count of qualified leads and then the filter will be date equal uh, last 30 days. And that's pretty much done for the first phase that really makes sure that uh, you are clear with uh, your direction in your data analytics process. Then let's go now on phase two, which is data strategy and collection. So now that we know where we're going, what's our goal for the analysis, we obviously have to collect some sort of data. And here I kind of collected the main methods that you can use to collect data and obviously to kind of define your data strategy. So the first method may be using the API. So here we are dealing with structure and internal data. When you work with API, you can obviously code it yourself with, uh, for example, a tool like Python. You can use tools that make it easier to work with APIs like Postman. So a bit of a mix of code and no code platform, or you can literally go full no code with 
the tools like Zapier. Then for your data collection, you may want to consider using ETL tools in case you have data sitting in a sort of a data warehouse in a database. That's obviously the majority of the cases because obviously if you are working in data analytics, you probably have access to some sort of database. And so you can use tools like Fivetran, Airbyte or Talent to uh, really create your ETL, make it automated so that anytime that you need data is pulling it automatically from your data source. In the exceptional case where you cannot use an API and you cannot use an ETL tool, well, you can go to basically collect the data yourself through web scraping. And so again, there are some libraries in Python that are specifically made for web scraping. For example, Beautiful Soup and Scrapy. In some cases, you may deal with uh, uh, data that actually doesn't require a lot of uh, headaches in order to collect it. Maybe it's a uh, manual uploads, maybe a small data set. And so here we have spreadsheets tools like Excel and Google Sheets. Or in other cases, you have to actually track the user behavior and events. For example, you know how people interact with your website. And so here we need uh, tracking tools like uh, Google Analytics 4, Mixed Panel and Segment. The last method that I put here is maybe more relevant for students that uh, need to collect some sort of data from real people that can be part of the exercise. And so we have surveys and forms. We have tools like Typeform and Google Forms to literally send forms to everyone and actually collect some real data. Okay, so phase two is done. We kind of define how we're gonna collect our data. And then uh, let's go now to phase three, which is data preparation and exploration. And so what I put here is that obviously when you collect some sort of data, you have to make sure that the data is clean. And so things that you may need to do is, for example, handling missing values. And so you can decide how to uh, do imputation of missing values, how to fill in those missing values, maybe with uh, some rules that you define. Or actually you can go with the approach of of, you know, keeping those missing values, but flagging them to your stakeholders as part of your assumptions and explanation of the analysis. A lot of times you will need to deal with uh, consistency checks, which means that probably you have to standardize date formats. Maybe you have dates in, I don't know, different time zones, depending, depending on the location, or maybe you have different currencies. So obviously, if you want to work with some sort of aggregated data, you have to make sure that all of these formats are standardized. And then you can go straight to the exploratory data analysis, uh, EDA, with things like, for example, descriptive summaries. So here we have measures of central tendencies, which is just a fancy name to say something like the mean, the median, then you have measures of dispersion and percentiles as well. You can start checking relationships between variables and so checking correlation. Uh, you can use pivot tables and cross tabs to bring in uh, metrics together, value, value together and check those uh, relationships. And obviously here you can use some simple visualizations to make your exploratory data analysis easier. So you can put metrics on histograms, uh, box plots, time series, line charts, and so on. And then again, still part of this data preparation and exploration, you can start looking at some metrics. So simple KPIs that you can calculate, you can start doing time based aggregations. Uh, so for example, aggregating the data by week, by month, obviously checking trends, you can start segment your variables. And so for example, if you have a bunch of customers, you can divide them by cohorts and cohorts can be defined by sign update by region by product tier and if you want to go a bit more advanced with your calculations and if it makes sense for your analytics then you have rolling calculations like moving averages uh, cumulative sums for seasonality and so with completing pretty much all of these steps here you should be able to have a kind of a clear idea of the data that you're dealing with and this will make you ready for the next phase which is phase four modeling and analysis and the way that i think about this the way that i think about the analysis step is basically dividing your type of analysis in three buckets here. And so you have descriptive type of analysis, which basically has the purpose to understand what happened. And here you can simply do, you know, aggregation, data visualization, simple reports, and common tools would be SQL, Power BI, and Tableau. And an example of a question that you might uh, ask yourself here is, what were our sales last quarter? Again, we are trying to understand what happened in the past. Then you have a predictive analytics. So we go a bit more advanced because this involves doing some forecast and understanding what might happen in the future. And so here we have some basic machine learning model like uh, regression, classification, and uh, time series forecasting. And so for this, you probably need to uh, start coding a bit in Python and using uh, Python libraries for, for example, scikit-learn for uh, machine learning. And again, if I need to give you kind of a practical example, which customers are likely to churn is a uh, question that you might ask yourself whenever you deal with predictive analytics. The third type of analysis that you may want to explore 
explore more is uh, prescriptive analytics. And so this uh, is basically based on suggesting what to do next. And so it's uh, really related to the decision making process of your stakeholders. And it's usually analytics that is connected a lot with the product analytics, uh, which is basically uh, doing a lot of A-B testing, see what's working, what's not. And again, a tool that is very common for prescriptive analytics is still Python. And the question that you can ask yourself as part of this analysis can be something like, what discount should we offer to maximize profit? And so now that you understand pretty much all the types of analytics that you can perform, then you are ready to move on for uh, phase number five. And phase number five is interpretation and insight generation. So now is really the time to create and formulate our insights. And so because again, I really like a methodical and uh, systemic approach on uh, for this phase as well, then what you can use is actually using this acronym INSIGHT to guide your interpretation and your analysis. And so if I zoom out here, we can identify the patterns. So we can look at trends, outliers, comparisons, and we start with the KPIs. So which channel consistently drives qualified leads if we use the first example that we started with in phase one. Then we can narrow down to what actually matters. So for example, we can focus on changes that are significant or unexpected. And so for example, why did conversion drop on the top landing page? Then we can segment the data, so break down KPIs by persona relevant segments, so channel, device, and region. And so we can ask ourselves, do leads from LinkedIn behave differently than Google Ads? Then we can interpret the why. So here we have to use our domain knowledge and data context to explore causes. And so we are going a bit outside the data that we have. And so for example, things like the audience, so things like the user experience may also impact the, the result of our analysis. Then we can start generating hypotheses. And so turning our interpretation into testable ideas. So maybe high cost per click on LinkedIn means fewer but better leads. Then we can highlight opportunities. So uh, what can be optimized, fixed or scaled. And so, for example, let's double down on Google Ads for cheaper CPL cost per lead. And then we can tell our story. So we can synthesize the findings into a narrative for the persona, which have to be clear, visual and actionable. And so if we talk to Sarah, we can say, OK, here is where your best leads are coming from. Here, I want to highlight the golden rule here, which is to always connect the insight back to the persona's pain point and success metric. And so this is phase five that we just defined here is really, really connected to phase one and our initial questions that we define and our persona that we identified. Now, if this is clear, we can go into phase number six, which is communication and decision support. So here, basically, we have to package our analysis in a clear way. So first of all, we have to build the narrative. So maybe we can decide to have a, a sort of executive summary. So two, three K, uh, takeaways and maybe some bullet points with a recommendation and then maybe more details on the appendices so like the methodology and things that we've seen also while exploring data we have to decide the delivery formats so it can be a dashboard so uh, you know with the widget as top kpis at the top then we have to decide our delivery formats and so it can be a dashboard with uh, you know top kpis and maybe interactive filters it can be a presentation so you know some sort of slides on powerpoint or similar tools or it can be a simple report in a format of a pdf or like a wiki pages that is shared internally. And then as part of your delivery, you can define the feedback loops. And so when reviewing this sort of analysis that you performed, maybe you can offer some support or for your stakeholders or so some data office hours. And also you have to make sure to define data governance. And so things like, you know, who has access to your data, who shouldn't see that data that you're presenting and so on. And so if this is all clear, then we can move on to the last step of our data analytics framework, which is called the deployment and maintenance. And so now that you finalize your analysis, maybe this is something that, you know, uh, people use constantly over time in the organization, then you have to move into production. And to do that, you have to probably automate the data pipelines. And so using tools like Airflow and DBT, create this automated ETL and continuously uh, take data from your data source. In my case, as a data analytics lead, I use pretty much on a daily basis uh, DBT. And this is perfect to uh, obviously create my ETL and also define a refresh schedule so that in my case, for example, every morning I know that all of my data is refreshed and goes directly into my dashboards. Things that you can do in DBT as well is the this second part here, monitoring and alerts. And so I set up some uh, data quality rules. And so, you know, 
uh, if the, there is a refresh in the morning and maybe there is a wrong row count or schema validation, then I need a system that alerts me that, you know, the data is uh, not quality anymore. And so I need to take the appropriate decisions on, you know, how to do it, how to uh, resolve the issue. And in my case, the alert that I set up using uh, DBT is actually to get some automated uh, notifications in a Slack channel that we have internally. And there you have it. This is my data analysis framework that you can follow whenever you're dealing with with any sort of data analysis. And as I said at the start, if you're interested in joining a career in data analytics, and if you want me to help you in a very personalized and customizable way, then make sure to check the link in the video description because the enrollments for my new analytics and automation academy are officially open and I'm reviewing now all the applications that I'm receiving. I already got students that land a job in data analytics thanks to our work together. And I'm definitely looking forward to help you as well in case you're interested. And in case you learn anything new today in this video, make sure to subscribe to my channel so that I can help you even further in the next videos. And well, enjoy the rest of your day. Ciao for now and see you in the next one.